So, who killed the battleship? Well, this can either be a very long video, going into hours and hours of detail and financial records, and discussions of various political parties and their policies across multiple nations. Or it can be a fun video which starts a lot of conversations. I know which I'm going for. So with that in mind, let's look at the potential culprits. But first, traditional shameless book plug. Yay. No, seriously, this channel would not be possible without all your support and all the people watching the channel, all the people subscribing, super chats, all that stuff. None of it would be possible without your support. And without you, those of you who buy my book, thank you very much. It's very nice to know it's now second edition for this Christmas. And yeah, as some of you who watch the channel regularly know, we are currently in the process of looking to move house. So <laughs> Shane's book plug is really, really not self-supporting this at current time. <laughs> it's more about puppy supporting and um, he needs his biscuit supply. He does. So, first off, there's a rather interesting thesis. You had Biggie Supply and you've come forward. That's uh, What Happened to the Battleship 1945 to Present by Chris Baker. That has pretty much an exhaustive, an exhaustive work on the subject of what happens, what the exact process is that ends up with us having no battleships left in active service. I don't really disagree with the thesis he puts forward, but I do disagree with some of the nuance and the focuses. I feel that they are slightly different. I feel that there is a real scenario where battleships would have still been being built if one of these villains, these particular culprits, hadn't done what they did. And there are five. There are five potential culprits, and as such, we'll be going through all five. Some of them are subsidiary culprits, I have to admit. Some of them are not so much culprits as they are potential culprits. Or accessories. But even those accessories can be the ones that deliver the final killing blow. The final fatal blow to the idea of having a battleship of building more battleships. Air power. Specifically jet aircraft more than propeller aircraft. This is an interesting point to bring up, but once you're dealing with jet powered aircraft, the range, the weight of ordnance they're carrying, etc. In increases. And that makes it very, very difficult for you to necessarily get your battleship within range. One of the things that's often discussed is the fact that pound for pound, the battleship is one of the most lethal things ever created. If you are within the fighting range of a battleship, it can sink you, and it will sink you if it's given a chance. I.e. if it's allowed to start firing. The whole point about aircraft is they try and keep that opponent out of the range at which it can actually engage you. Yes, its range is long, but the range of the aircraft is longer. Now, here is the interesting thing with that one. There is a certain point at which it's a law of diminishing returns, i.e. the aircraft range is longer, but if the ship's gun range is long enough, i.e. with the modern rail guns, etc., if they come in and actually start working, it can become back as a viable system. I don't think it will come back as a viable system in terms of being called a battleship, but a primary gun arm ship could well return. The point is, though, at that point we'll be talking about rail guns with ranges of several hundred, if not potentially several thousand kilometres to fire their guns. A range is equivalent to the range of a strike aircraft. But basically, once you're dealing with jet aircraft and the capabilities of those aircraft in providing long-range interception, the primary role of battleships killing other ships 
is reduced. Okay, what's the secondary roles? Fire support for amphibious operations. Well, if you're doing massive amphibious operations, then that's useful. If you're not conducting it, that's less so. And defense of the task group and defense of the carrier. Well, that's when you get another problem. The carriers are becoming bigger and more powerful. The outer air defense is more and more about the fighters. Then you have missiles. And then eventually you have guns. Well, you either have to build a brand new battleship that really can take advantage of all the missile technology. Or you don't. Because, frankly, there's a limitations to what it can provide, to what it can do for you. Sorry, just moving it so you can see. He, he's trying to get very much into the camera, so. Now, that is all a good, that's a, a nice idea, it's a nice thing to do. The battleship is useful still. But how much money are you spending to get a battleship and do you need it for that role? Do you need it for those roles? And the aircraft carrier is getting bigger. It's getting more powerful. It can carry more and more aircraft. Each individual carrier is more and more vital. And then we have this. The fact is, if you look through history, often the biggest motivation to build battleships in fact, to build all major surface ships. And even most principal submarines, the major submarines, the SSBNs and SSGNs of this world, i.e. the ballistic missile subs and the big cruise missile subs, has been our opposition. It's been who you're building to fight. Stalin dies and the Soviet Union stops pushing for battleships. If the Soviet Union had built battleships, I can guarantee you the West would have responded with battleships. It's a simple factor as that, because they couldn't allow the Soviet Union to have a brand new battleship and then not have a brand new battleship that can match it. Because ultimately, ultimately, what can you guarantee will kill your uh, kill the, your opponent's big, many thousand, uh, tens of thousands ton killing machine? What will stop it? Well, the only thing you can guarantee has a chance of stopping it is your own tens of thousands ton death machine. That's pretty much it. That's what you're talking about. You know, the big blasting system fights the big blasting system. Often the argument of what's the best uh, best tank killing system is a better tank. These days we might argue it's an anti-tank missile system, but again, there are scenarios where those don't work. And usually that does depend on the opponent who's operating those tanks actually following their own doctrine. But we'll leave that to one side. Militaries have a long history of ignoring their doctrine once they get into war and then relearning the lessons of their own doctrine which they developed in peacetime in that war with bloodshed. And you sit there and go, didn't you practice this in exercises? Well, we did. And then we thought we were smarter because we thought the enemy was dumber. Ah, cute. Well, with the death of Stalin, you have no more Soviet battleships. With no more Soviet battleships, it becomes harder and harder to justify a battle fleet maintaining your own battleships because they'd been there as backups. They'd been there essentially as your systems available to deal with a Soviet battle fleet. And again, seeing as the Soviets never get rid of anything, if they'd had battleships, they would have kept them going right into the end. And let's be honest, the Russians haven't got rid of anything they haven't been forced to either. They've still got the Kirovs going, they've got Kuznetsov going, all these things. The odds are, the West would have had to be the same. There would still be battleships wandering around. They'd be modernised, upgraded. Those things would be a combination probably between a Kirov and an Iowa in their sort of ideology, in their form and shape. They'd probably have battleship guns forward and missiles all over the place aft. And helicopters. They'd be really quite scary, quite interesting ships. 
And just as we have, some nations have a couple of carriers, large carriers, so they, you know, they still retain that level and they need to because of various commitments around the world and various interests. You probably have the same number of nations but have a couple here, there, and America would have the majority, like they have with carriers. Which would give us a bit of variety. Also, make an interesting case for defense funding. But yeah, let's get into that one, because there's also the air power of missiles. And this is often the one trumped against the battleship, and it's a very true one. You build a battleship, that's going to take a huge amount of money to build, to armor, to you know, create. A huge amount of infrastructure has to exist to support the creation of battleships. Similar levels of infrastructure that exist to support the creation of nuclear submarines. You do that, great. All your opponent has to do is build a missile which can punch through your armor. Or can attack you from a position where your armor is weak. That's all your opponent has to do. And the trouble is, these missiles can be mounted on things which cost a lot less than a battleship to build. This is a P-15 Termite. Or the SN-2C. And it's often mounted on patrol boats. Fast motorboats, the successors to a torpedo boat. Could it sink a battleship? Possibly, possibly not. Doesn't really matter. You can afford to have 16 of those torpedo boats dash in, launch roughly eight missiles apiece at the battleship, and that will probably be enough to, fire, to sink it. And they can probably launch those missiles before the battleship can engage with its guns. So then you have to justify escorting the battleship. You've got to have things escorting it. It's one of the interesting things. When the Iowas are reactivated to form the centers of surface action groups in the late Cold War as a response to Kirov's, they're really good ships at the center of the surface, uh, of the surface groups. But they, it is basically the same principle as a carry battle group. You've got all these escorts around to make sure the battleship can do its job, which is to kill anything that gets within range of its guns. But to get near those things within range of its guns, it needs the rest of the task group. It's like the carrier can, ki uh, can kill stuff and strike stuff within range of its aircraft. But to make sure it's got the freedom to do that, it needs its own fighter aircraft aboard and it needs the carrier battle group, the rest of the task group, to provide its outer, its outer layers of security. And again, is a battleship surface action group as useful as a carrier battle group? It's similar in cost. Is it as useful? And that's the final thing, cost. Now, here are two rather interesting graphs. One shows, on this side, the amount of money being spent in billions. One shows on this side the percentage of GDP being spent on defense. The billions have gone up, the percentage has gone down. Other things have demanded a share of government spending, whether they're social security, national health service, whatever they are. Doesn't matter, they've demanded it, and they've got it. You can say it's arguably sensible because it's about protecting the nation from a wide range of other threats and allowing stability for it to grow. That's fine. But the factor is, we were affording defense spending, including battleships, in the 1900s. And defense spending was not much more than it is today. Today it hovers around about 2%. In the 1900s it was roughly around 3%. So it was about an extra percent in terms of defense spending. I would have to say also that they didn't include things like um, the war memorials and <laughs> pensions <laughs> in defence spending in the 1900s, in the early in the, in sort of the 19, early 1930s as well. Um, but um, yeah, they do today. So 
In 1930s, when we're in the run-up to and preparing for World War II, admittedly, you're trying to get the government to actually spend some money, they're spending a little bit more than they are today, in percentage terms, but a lot less in terms of amount. This is where politicians come with the real-term spending, real amount spending has gone up, is going up. Yes, is it matching inflation? And that's the other problem you have, you have defence inflation. Now, what is defence inflation? Well, there are three drivers when you're buying something. One is the number you're buying. So basically it's how many goods are there, is the profit is the profit margin going to be set out across, how many goods are the research costs going to be set out across, how many goods are the, isn't it, what volume of goods, research costs, the profit and the running costs of the company involved are going to be set out across. When defence, you also have to pay a premium above that because you're paying for the potential because often you're not buying enough to keep the procurement and the factories and systems at the level at which you need them to be in wartime to supply your needs in war, so you have to pay a premium. Then you have the fact that defence has got increasingly complicated and you're not just paying to include systems produced by one company, you have to pay fees to make sure that there are systems can talk to other systems from other companies and make them work at work together. And often these companies don't like each other, they haven't liked each other for a long time, and getting them to work together so their systems actually operate with each other is often a case of arm twisting and paying through the nose. This adds up to the cost of things. This is why real terms, and I'm going to use that favorite political uh, politician saying, we're spending two and a half, two percent to two and a half percent of a year on defense on defense. Okay, GDP. Sometimes it's dropped lower, but usually it's over two, and sometimes it goes a bit higher. In real terms, we're probably paying a 50% premium on everything we buy because of the cost of not producing enough. That's one of the really interesting things. If you consider in the 1930s, we haven't been building battleships for years, we're able to spool up and start building battleships because of the sheer amount of battleships we've been building earlier in the, in the 20th century, in the 1900s. We're able to spool up because of the amount of resources and infrastructure available and churn out battleships. We churn out the King George V class. We churn out Vanguard. We refit, we repair, we you know, modernize a whole stream of other ships. We churn out aircraft carriers. All those things are done by Britain because they can, because they have the infrastructure. Nowadays, you have a lot less infrastructure. In this period, you also had, for a lot of it, you had government-owned yards. Now, here is the fun thing. Most of the time, you were, uh, people will spout things about, well, competition, free market, tends to reduce prices. It does. If there is competition, and you are both producing an equally good product, then you'll probably be forced into pricing fairly similar to each other, because people buy the cheaper one, because they're equally good. So you have to make your, profit, your, your products a lot better to justify your higher cost, or you have to make it a lot cheaper to try and get it in under the margins of the other to try and get control. Well, with less and less procurement of systems going on, you've had a case turn up of pretty much a monopolistic system has developed, whereby whilst they, it's technically it's bidded out to private companies, those private companies are literally the sole potential provider. In the Britain, there are two. And those yards don't even compete for the, pretty much the same projects. There is literally one area they overlap on. Otherwise, if you're going to build a Type 83, I can tell you which yard that's going to be built, the next generation destroyer. If you're going to build the next Type 32, I can tell you which yard that's going to be built, that's the next generation light frigate. If you're building OPVs, I can tell you which yard that's going to go from. Eat without even bothering to go through yes there'll be a competition yes there'll be four companies will put it in we know which one will win why because it'll be it's the government is not going to outsource it to a, a foreign country 
They're going to build it in Britain, and there's limited options in Britain. And we know which yards are going to price because they have a gap in the work and which yards are full up and have work going through and it really isn't in their interest to take on that extra job but they're going to bid on it to give it the illusion of there being disparate options and this is not a collusion there is not collusion going on i'm just stating that that's pretty much what it looks like you only have to look at the type 31 project and the whole various options put forward by various suppliers and then look at the realistic rates being put behind them and you soon realize hmm that one's going to win from the beginning. Everyone does it honestly. But the fact is, so if a yard is building the Type 26, they don't want to also take on the job of building the Type 31. They cannot build both simultaneously. It would disrupt the Type 26 too much. In which case, that means they have to charge a premium to t if they're going to take on the Type 31 because of the amount of effort, this extra effort it's going to cause. So that automatically prices them out of it. Okay, then to the other yards. They don't want... Uh, Camel Lads... Let's put it this way. We're going to go with... Uh, that's Glasgow doing the Type 26. We can go with um, BAE. We can go with Camel Lads who are doing a whole load of one-off projects and earn a lot of money doing specialist ships and reconfiguring ships and doing the RFA. So they don't really want to do the Type 31s. Harlan and Wolf. Not really the right project for them either. Appledore can't really fit it. Oh! Okay, Babcock. Yeah, pretty much the only option. And we can do the same in America. You can walk through. There is actually a debate about whether or not they should establish a third yard to build submarines. Yes. You'll have to guarantee it enough work, though, to make it worthwhile building, or you'll have to build an actual US naval-owned yard again. And it's the same with Britain. Because at a certain point... You're not talking about actual competition. You're talking about keeping multiple monopolies going. In which case, they might as well be raw dockyards and you delete the profit margin. Because that's an impact in how much you can buy. Does that explain why you're not getting battleships? <sighs> yes and no. A premium started to kick in quite early in the 50s. And without the justification of them being built by the Soviets, anyone looking at larger ships, well, you have to look at the costs and who you're going to build it with. You have to look at the costs and who you're going to build it with. In the 1950s, these were still in reserve. You still had HMS Howe wandering around. You still had Vanguard. The fact that Britain didn't preserve a battleship disturbs me on many, many levels. The only preserved British battleship in the world is the Mikasa in Japan. But leaving that to one side, why no more battleships? Well, you have the cost of them versus what they could do. You have the fact that no one really produced anything which justified their existence. And the moment they did, the Kirovs, the Americans just reactivated the hours. Nowadays, there's one of those Kirovs wandering around. Um, Peter Vilecki is pretty much wandering around. There is another one which is supposed to be coming back into service soon after the world's most extended refit. But... It's viability when it comes back into service, we'll see, and that means the Peter Vilecki will be going out of service. And in real terms, impact, I would say that probably when the Kirov turns up, it has about it would have about the same diplomatic impact as a Zumwalt these days. Because a Zumwalt isn't as big as a Kirov, but that shit does look striking and very different from everyone else's. Although the Americans don't seem to be in a hurry to deploy them around the place as diplomatic assets. Battleships had a role as long as they were needed and as long as they were justified. And they would be paid for as long as they were both. The thing is, the justification for them becomes weaker once you get many systems which do the same role. 
and when you have to pay for uh, when you have a cost and prices going up and the real the actual amount of money you have proportionally to pay for the things going down battleships become unattractive assets at a certain point as useful as they might have been and let's be honest they could have been very useful in the Falklands War the Royal Navy could have really done with a battleship largely for two reasons one they needed a command facility and flag facility for the amphibious task group because as much as HMS Fearless tried it really wasn't set up for it it wasn't like Albion and Bulwark are today and the 15 inch guns would have been really quite useful in providing fire support for the marines wandering around the Falklands and probably would have been able to hit most targets from San Carlos Bay Honestly, they would have probably been able to hit quite a large chunk of the targets they money needed from San Carlos Bay, if not all of them. There are some issues with thing, with actual mountains getting in the way, which might, might mean they have to move, but we'll leave that to one side. But you could argue that that, that utility would actually have been negated if Britain had had CVA-01 and the proper carrier program, because they'd have had an outer fighter air defence, They'd have had larger strike aircraft than a Harrier. And frankly, that would have probably enabled things like the commando carrier, i.e. HMS Hermes, to be deployed in to be deployed in to the San Carlos Bay to support the helicopter amphibious task group. And of course, that does have flag facilities aboard it. The point is, as useful as a battleship might have been, there are other systems which would be more useful for that money to be spent on than keeping a battleship in service. And it's a constant fight to justify things with people who often don't see their value. You see, with the policing, with healthcare, with education, people see its value every day. We know the problem. We can see the problems very quickly of an uneducated populace. We can see the problems very quickly of not having a police force. I know that might shock some people to say it, but you do really find them useful. And if you get rid of them, you very quickly would have to replace them with something else. And the thing you would really want, not want to replace them with is private security guards, because that very quickly becomes pretty much private armies with a license to do what they need to do. And that is not good. Take it from a country which has a history of feudalism. We saw the problems of that firsthand. The police, uh, the police system is a better system. Same with healthcare. You need it. It's useful. You know, if you uh, if you don't deal, if you leave everyone to it themselves, they can get very ill and then you have a problem with your popula a population. I think about it, if you spend money educating people, training them up to be vibrant parts of your workforce, and then they get ill and they can't work, or even and then they become a burden that needs to be taken care of, or even worse, they die, then you've just lost all that investment. Healthcare makes sense. The trouble is with armed forces is they're kind of like a fire service in that most of the time they're going around just wandering around checking things making sure it's okay making sure there aren't any too, too many risks keeping an eye on things and maybe reminding people to stick up fire alarms the moment there's a fire you really need them but until then they're just there they're not really that visible. You you realize how brave and how vi valuable they are to the community, but you don't really see them. With armed forces, that's even worse. 
because what they do is mostly beyond the vision of the local community, of the community that's paying for them. They mostly try and deal problems a long time before they reach you. That is where their problem comes in in justifying their funding. Because it's very easy to have the idea of let's cut spending on that or that. It's a long way away. The trouble is modern weaponry and modern world means it will come to you far quicker than it used to. <laughs> and it used to come to you then. The world's problems can quickly become your problems. Especially if you're a nation which is dependent upon trade and movement of goods. And pretty much every nation in the world is dependent on trade and movement of goods by sea. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. And hope that starts off a discussion. Why no more battleships? Justification and cost. My argument. But what have we got coming up this week? We have the Battle of Sinop. 1853. Hope you're enjoying yourselves. Hope you look forward to that. Thank you very much for watching and take care.